delighted uh, to be able to welcome you all to this uh, concluding uh, keynote session with our keynote, uh, leader of the Scottish uh, Conservative and Unionist uh, Party, delighted uh, that she and our respondent, Lord Darling, have uh, made the way uh, from Scotland today on the prospects for Scottish unionism, uh, two of the uh, heaviest uh, hitters in the debate on unionism north of the border and nationally in the last uh, decade and a half. So delighted to be able to welcome you. They then get kindly agreed to answer questions. So Ruth, looking forward very much to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. A warm welcome always here on our platform. Thank you for friendship and support. Thank you. Good afternoon, and while we're thanking lots of people, I'd like to give my thanks to Policy Exchange for staging this, what I think is an important conference today, and for taking such a timely interest in the question of our union and its future. Like the UK itself, this subject is complex and multifaceted, but the bit that I want to focus on today is to discuss the constitutional state of play in Scotland as I see it, to give my own assessment of where we are, and explain some of the apparent contradictions that we see in Scottish politics. Uh, I'd then like to use this opportunity here in London to throw out a challenge, to make the case, as it were, that if we want things to stay the same, then things are going to have to change. Or rather, to argue that if we want the union to flourish, indeed the UK to continue, then we need to work at it, to embrace change, and to think harder about how to do so. But to talk about the future, please let me rewind to the past. The first talk of independence started in earnest in 2007. That's 11 years ago when the SNP had their breakthrough at Holyrood. In 2011, they won a majority and the button was pressed on a referendum. In 2012, in a move unprecedented in my lifetime, Labour, the Conservatives, the Liberal Democrat parties joined forces to create a campaign group called Better Together led by the man responding to me today, Alistair Darling. In 2013, Alex Salmond and Nicola Sturgeon named the date for the referendum, which they said would be a once-in-a-generation vote. In 2014, the country voted by 55.3% to 44.7%, and by 28 local authority areas to four to stay in the United Kingdom in a vote which, by the last few days, had been billed by the nationalists as once-in-a-lifetime. In 2015, the SNP rode a post-referendum wave and took 56 out of the 59 Scottish seats at the general election, securing more than 50% of the popular vote in Scotland. In 2016, the SNP lost the majority at Holyrood in May and in June claimed the Brexit result meant they should get another shot at independence. In 2017, Nicola Sturgeon made an official call to request a second independence referendum in March, in April, Theresa May called a snap general election, and in June, the SNP lost 21 seats and nearly half a million votes. And that brings us up to yesterday, when Nicola Sturgeon went on the Peston on Sunday programme to say that she was going to restart the debate on independence, which came as news to much of Scotland, as we'd never heard her stop it. <laughs> now, I've been leader of the Scottish Conservative Party for six and a half years, and in that time, I have fought six national elections and two referenda, and each and every one of them has either been partially coloured or out and out dominated by the constitutional question. And sometimes the past feels like another country. At the start of Better Together, Alistair was surrounded by David McCletchie, by Charles Kennedy, by Jim Murphy and Joanne Lamont, Douglas Alexander, Danny Alexander, and in the final few weeks, we saw interventions from Gordon Brown, David Cameron, Nick Clegg, and Ed Miliband. Two are gone forever, the rest departed from the political front line. And in many ways, I feel a little like the last woman standing. But for all the changing of the guard, the debate hasn't changed. We still have Nicola Sturgeon push, push, pushing to rerun a vote that she promised the people of Scotland would be settled if they did their democratic duty. And they did, in spades. And the tragedy of all of this is the capacity that it uses up. The restarting of the debate that the First Minister proffered on television yesterday is to hang on a long-awaited Growth Commission report setting out a new economic path towards independence. It appears that the old plan, having been rejected, is now to be trashed and a fresh plan put in its place. As the saying goes, I have my principles and if you don't like them, I've got others. 
This will undoubtedly be surrounded by a new push launched at party conference next month with a new domain name, a change of branding, and government ministers spending as much time on the campaign trail as they do on their briefs. Ask about falling school standards, question missing NHS targets, or challenge an economic growth rate that's half that of the UK's, and see those legitimate questions of efficacy and governance swept aside in renewed enthusiasm for the old project. As I said, this debate started in earnest 11 years ago. Imagine if, for 11 years, education had dominated our national debate, or we'd spent 11 years finding real solutions to social care amid an ageing demographic, or if we'd used that decade and more to champion Scottish business, entrepreneurship, enterprise and export. But we find ourselves 11 years on, back almost where we started, with a minority nationalist government wanting us all to take one more go on the merry-go-round, I suspect to end up exactly where we began, with a majority unpersuaded, unconvinced and unimpressed. In the face of this, complacency among unionists might be tempting. Tempting, but it would be wrong. Because the facts are these. Anywhere between 40 and 45% of my fellow countrymen and women currently say they want no part of the United Kingdom. That our parliament in Edinburgh currently has a majority of MSPs who support independence and want the 300-year-old union to end. And that the SNP, having just completed its 11th year in power, continues to use all the muscle and measures and influence government provides to prise apart the UK ever further, every hour of every day. So for all that independence seems to have lost momentum and may feel like yesterday's battle, it is still real and it is still present. The union continues to be under threat. And those of us who want to protect it should not therefore downplay the challenges that we face. And what is the nature of that challenge? Time, perhaps, to get straight to the Brexit element, elephant, even, that's in the room. As you all know, Scotland as a whole voted to remain within the European Union two years ago. And as you all remember, this was seized on immediately by Nicola Sturgeon as giving her the right to demand a second referendum. For a few weeks, Brexit looked to the nationalists like it would provide them with a new rationale for separatism. And it's fair to say that many pro-union politicians feared that they would be successful. Nearly two years on from the Brexit vote, the picture has, however, turned out to be far more complicated than we might have imagined. And as Sir John Curtis recently explained, Brexit had turned out to be as much a problem for the independence movement as it has been an opportunity. And that's not because the majority of people in Scotland have changed their minds in the EU. There is scant evidence of that. But largely, I would suggest, it has been due to the fact that none of us, including the First Minister herself, quite foresaw the way the electorate would respond to the SNP's demands. Firstly, they tried to attempt to corral the votes of Remain Voting Scots to the cause of independence, and that backfired. I didn't vote Remain to have my vote co-opted as a proxy for separation, and nor did thousands of Scots like me. And there is no doubt that the SNP has lost trust among many voters for having tried to claim that proxy. But secondly, and perhaps more significantly, the simplistic claim that Scotland voted to stay in the EU, ignored the fact that, in fact, more than one million Scots actually voted to leave. And it also ignored the fact that a large number are, or were, supporters of the SNP and independence. <coughs> the result, as Sir John has added, is that Brexit has, and I'll quote him directly here, served to expose a fissure in the nationalist movement that Nicola Sturgeon has struggled to straddle. And the consequence was apparent in last year's general election, where nearly 500,000 former SNP voters deserted the party, leaving the pro-independence cause severely damaged. From having insisted on a referendum as early as next year, the official SNP stance is currently to wait and see what Brexit brings, reverting back to its favoured position of seeing if anything turns up. Now, at this point, I could easily talk up the theory that Nicola Sturgeon's blown it, that the union is safe and that independence has had it. But again, I would repeat my warning about the dangers of complacency. The Scottish government, the nationalist government, is still working every day with every vehicle at its disposal to try to prise our part country apart and to use the consequences of Brexit to do so. 
And given that we don't yet know those full consequences, and who does, we simply don't know how people will respond over the medium term. We do know that just as some pro-Leave Scots have left the independence side, so some pro-Remain Scots have gone the other way. And all of us, all of us who want to see our United Kingdom endure and flourish should therefore agree that we must be careful not to push more people into following them. For example, I, I hear it said from some pro-Union Scots that following Brexit, they now feel their relationship with the rest of the UK is transactional. That where once emotion and a sense of shared values bonded them together with the UK as a whole, now it's down to brass tacks and necessity of economic security and of regulatory ease. Because the alternative is worse and there's just far too much upheaval already. Now make no mistake, these are adequate reasons for the United Kingdom. They speak to the Union's utility, to its usefulness, but I find them insufficient nonetheless. Firstly, because this provides a shallow basis for an enduring relationship, more like a prenup in the lawyer's office, ready for use when the split comes along. But secondly, because it doesn't speak to the union that we have experienced these last 300 years. Our union has always been about much more than mere convenience. We're not tenants in a shared block of flats, known only to each other when we pass one another on the stairs. We are a union of peoples. And despite the best attempts of those attempting our breakup, the union is not something that is done to us. It is something that we have ownership of, that we've built and we've fashioned and we've sculpted and we've done it again and again and again. And we should hold ourselves to that standard. So while Brexit may not have made the headline difference to the percentage support for or against the union, we must be careful that it does not erode support for the union beneath the numbers. We must do all that we can to add to the reasons for continuing engagement. And the question is therefore, how do we do that? Well, let me use up the rest of my time by throwing up some ideas. Over the last 20 years, the conventional solution to Scottish disaffection with the Union has been to devolve power. In the 80s and 90s, devolution was viewed primarily by Labour as an answer to the complaint that Scotland had to accept a government that it did not vote for. And this process has now convincingly taken place. Three Scotland Acts have been passed. The first, devolving power to Holyrood, the second, devolving a greater say on taxation and on borrowing powers, and the third, two years ago, devolving all income tax and now huge powers over welfare too. This has been a remarkable reform in the history of the United Kingdom. It is still taking time to bed in, and don't just take my word for it, take the, from the SNP who's finding the task of building a new welfare state so difficult it's had to ask Westminster to hang on to welfare provision for several extra years. But once it is settled, however, the upshot will be that the Scottish Parliament will be the most powerful parliament of its kind anywhere in the world. Free to set taxes, free to create new benefits, to run health and education any way it sees fit, to take control of everything from weapons licensing to speed limits to the Crown Estate to abortion law. The Scottish Conservatives, from being sceptics of devolution in the late 90s, have long since changed their position to welcome many of these reforms. Indeed, it was the Strathclyde Commission set up under my leadership which first proposed the transfer of income tax and welfare to Holyrood, something that Labour had to be encouraged into supporting. And as we catch breath on this incredible period of constitutional change, here's where I think we stand. First, the union has proved as good as its word. As promised, power has been devolved out of Whitehall. We have created a genuinely autonomous and powerful parliament for Scotland, something that the country wanted. The settled will has been acted upon and it has changed the union for good. Second, that the hectic progress that we have seen in devolution over the last 20 years is going to continue when, thanks to Brexit, even more powers come back to the regions and nations of the United Kingdom. And far from it being a power grab, as the SNP's spurious claim goes, Brexit will see powers that have been held at Brussels level for the entire period of devolution be transferred to Holyrood for the very first time. And third, as a consequence of all of this, the institutions of the Union are being tested in their ability to keep up. 
This is something that has, in truth, struggled to do over the last few years. As the Prime Minister said last year, there has been a tendency to devolve and forget in Whitehall. Powers head out of London, Whitehall closes the book. It's as if, with so much power going to Scotland and Wales, SW1 takes the view that it can just happily let us get on with it. And that's all very well. But it does cause problems when, inevitably, Westminster does indeed have to turn its attentions to matters in Scotland or Wales, as it must. Westminster is the UK's national parliament, after all. But nor does it reflect the reality of devolution. For all the increases in devolution over the last 20 years, the Scottish Parliament isn't in charge of an independent state. The Scottish electorate made sure of that. Power in Scotland is more accurately shared between our two governments, and we need to reflect that better. We must never get to the stage where Scotland, or indeed Wales, or Northern Ireland, are somehow deemed other to the UK, where UK ministerial visits take on the appearance of state visits of, to, of a foreign nation. This simply isn't what Scotland voted for when we decided to stay part of the UK. So back to my basic question, what is it that we need to do? And I would like to suggest two things. Firstly, the union needs to catch up with the constitutional revolution it has overseen in the last few years, and it needs to administer that system better. And secondly, Scotland and other parts of the UK don't just need more devolution, they now need more union too, to show that all the parts of the UK are just that, part and parcel of our great union of nations with each in their parts has helped to build. And to take the first point in detail, Britain's operating system needs attention and there are plenty of ways to do this. Practically, we need to see greater collaboration between our layers of government and if we can provide an example where good practice already takes place, the expansion of city region deals across Scotland. In Glasgow, in Edinburgh and in areas right across the country, funding from both the UK government and Scottish government is pooled to support regional economic plans led by local leaders. Political turf has been set aside. And we are seeing progress in areas of local priority thanks to governments working in unison. Of course, this level of intervention won't be appropriate day-to-day -day areas which are fully devolved like education and health. But on strategic public investment, it is entirely appropriate that the UK government is part of the mix. Not forgetting, not interfering, but sharing responsibility. And in addition to practical ideas like city deals, we also need to work on the structures that, that underpin joint working between the governments of the UK. Something that is all the more pressing now Brexit is coming. In the early days of devolution, when Labour was in power in both Holyrood and Westminster, the relationship seemed to be governed by a series of phone calls between colleagues, generally sorted out when Gordon Brown got involved. And perhaps Alistair can let me know whether I'm right or wrong about that. But either way, that is no way to run a country, especially when, as now, one side of that relationship is in politics specifically to break that country up. So we need to do more, more joint working at official level, a deeper, deeper understanding on both sides of the constitution that we've created. And ironically, for all that the SNP is trying to use Brexit to muster as much discord and friction as it can, the way we are handling the process of leaving the EU shows the way to go. You wouldn't know it from the SNP press releases, but the truth is that behind the scenes, officials from the UK government and the devolved administrations have been working hard quietly detailing how to transfer EU powers back to the UK, to see where UK-wide frameworks will be required, to examine which require legislation and which don't, to agree where powers can safely be devolved without harming the UK internal market. As the Welsh have acknowledged, this process has been conducted collaboratively. It has been a more equitable approach to intergovernmental relations, and it has shown through dialogue and open discussion and close contact how our national and devolved governments can work across political boundaries to achieve common goals. And it's this kind of approach that now needs to be built on. So I'm pleased. I'm pleased that the UK government has agreed to review the current intergovernmental structures to ensure that they're fit for purpose as we leave the EU. Not a stepping stone to federalism, as some might have it, but a focus on how to make devolution and our union with it work better. And just as I want to see the institutions of the Union working better with our devolved nations, I'd also like to see more of them in our part of the world too. We've had more devolution in Scotland, 
We now need more union. And as I said in my speech to the Conservative Party conference last year, we remain far too London-centric as a nation. No other comparable developed nation is as dominated by its capital city quite as much as we are. And the consequence of this is that the union too often can feel like something done to people rather than something they take part in. So while I speak as someone who is a happy and affectionate visitor, I would argue that we must start to divest London of some of its power. As our own manifesto put it last year, for too long power has been centred in London, and this means opportunity is centred in London too. It is time the major cities around Britain shared in the government of the United Kingdom. Indeed, for our civil service and major cultural bodies to claim to be UK institutions, they need to represent and be present across our whole United Kingdom. And it's good to see the UK government delivering on this, most notably with the current plan to move Channel 4 out of London. Of course, I am biased, and I think that Glasgow is the clear and standout candidate to host it, but wherever it goes, Channel 4 should just be the start. For example, a new UK government hub is opening soon in Edinburgh. It's not just a chance to create more public sector jobs, it's an opportunity to ensure government officials are closer to industries with importance to us, like clean energy. Arms length bodies are still mostly based in London, and forgive me, but if they're at arm's length, why do they need to be in touching distance from SW1? And our cultural institutions, we see progress being made here already, and I'm thinking in particular of the soon-to-be-opened V&A Museum in Dundee. But why not more? Why is it that we must come to London to see the wonders of the British Museum? Why not create a second home for the museum, nearer to where most of the rest of us live? And on Brexit, we know that huge new powers will be repatriated to these shores. Should our newly empowered fisheries industry be run from London? Shouldn't it instead be based in Peterhead? And instead of EU structural funds, poorer parts of the UK are to be supported by a new UK shared prosperity fund. So shouldn't it therefore be based in one of the poorer parts of the UK instead of one of the richest cities on the planet? I think it should. Or if we take sport, Nothing has the power to bring a country together more, and ironically, given what I've said about London, it was the London Olympics which shared its venues across the UK and which provided the most vivid recent examples. So we should be thinking of what other events we can bring to the nation. I hesitate here in floating the idea of a joint UK-wide World Cup bid, because I know how much trouble I'm going to get in with the SFA. But it is a thought, and this is a think tank, so what the hell? But it doesn't mean a joint team on the pitch. Um, definitely not. But the point is this, a country that spreads its power and its cultural networks across the country will ensure that all of us, no matter where we live, feel that we have a real stake in it. Too many people feel that the union is something that's projected onto them. Spreading its benefits around more evenly will ensure it's something that they own and something that they want to belong to. And that is a prize that all unionists should commit to working towards. Building a country, a union of nations, that isn't held together by mere convenience, but is kept together by the deeper bonds of shared identity and mutual values. Because frankly, I cannot be satisfied in fighting for the UK solely by pointing to the many flaws of separation. I don't resile from exposing the SNP's arguments, of course, but doing only that doesn't do justice to the country that I love and the country that I want others in Scotland, Wales, England, and Northern Ireland to love too. So I believe we must confront a paradox. Part of what I love about Britain is its very messiness. No founding text, no single document constitution, uncodified, relaxed and flexible. That's the British way. We adapt and we accommodate, not least by cordially agreeing a referendum that could have ended our very existence. And in so doing, we have survived and prospered in a way that other nations have failed to do. But the paradox is this. If we want this flexible messiness to continue, faced with the constitutional challenges of the coming few years, we need to pay more care and attention to the way in which we do business. It is fine being flexible. It is not so good if tolerance lapses into indifference. So if the UK is to stay, we must face reform with boldness. And we will, I believe, find a receptive audience if we do. Because all of the evidence shows most Scots don't want to go back yet to more constitutional division. They just want the UK state to act in a manner which respects their interests and seeks to make life better for all. We have delivered 
a better system of devolution. Now the challenge is to deliver a better union too. And if we do that, if we do that, I'm confident that we can see off separation. We can meet the aspirations of people who don't currently see their future in the UK and we can build a stronger nation for all. Thank you. Good afternoon and uh, thank you again, Dean, for putting this uh, seminar on. I've been asked to respond briefly to what Ruth had to say, and I suppose I've reached that stage in politics where I have largely retired and intend to remain retired, uh, where I can say that I agree with much of what you said, <laughs> apart from the bit where you wrote me out of the script uh, at an early stage in your speech. And I hope you will take it in the right way when I say to you I've watched you grow in Scottish politics and in the UK politics, and I still often wonder why you're a Tory, but there you are. <laughs> I want to respond to some of the things that have been said today about Scotland because of my experience in the referendum campaign. Uh, and I also want to touch briefly on some of the things that were said in the earlier session. I was interested in Maurice Glassman's quite thoughtful remarks uh, about decentralisation and in, in particular in relation to uh, local banks. Now, I do know something about banks. Uh, and I was reminded of the fact that uh, when I was 17, I opened my first bank account in a very local bank called the Royal Bank of Scotland in Edinburgh. Uh, a few years later, it was RBS. A few years later, it was the biggest bank in the world. And 10 years ago this October, I ended up owning it. <laughs> <laughs> On your behalf, of course. So it just shows that these regional banks, there might be something in this. What I want to do is just to briefly look at the Scottish referendum, and inevitably that touches on Brexit, to draw on the lessons that I draw from it, and also to touch on the arguments this morning. Because one of the things that struck me this morning is an awful lot of the view of Scotland was somehow it was about the love of institutions, of being British, or flags, uh, partly emotion, but partly, you know, this, this, this is an end in itself. Whereas when we started fighting the referendum campaign in Scotland in 2012, I was very clear from the start it was about the economy. There's about a third of Scotland who is inclined to vote nationalist, partly those who believe in Scottish exceptionalism, they, they believe that Scotland should be on its own as a matter of principle, and that's the end of the argument. Partly those that say, look, we've got nothing in common uh, with uh, our neighbours, we should be on our own, um, uh, and other reasons too. But about a th just under a third would take that view, and equally on the other end of the political spectrum, there are people, uh, probably just over a third, who would take the view that, come what may, uh, the United Kingdom is something they value, and they won't hear every ar any argument against it. But there are a very large number of people in the middle whose votes were up for grabs. And basically, their inclination was to vote to leave, uh, to say yes to the nationalist proposition, unless you could convince them that they would be worse off economically, uh, that there would be greater harm to themselves and their families. And there was a lot of criticism at the time in the way that we ran that campaign, but I was very clear that you had to do two things. Yes, you had to point to the ties of people north and south of the border, the family ties, the history and all the rest of it. But you also had to make a practical case as well. Because whether you like it or not, for a large number of people in Scotland, it is increasingly the case it is a utilitarian relationship within the United Kingdom rather than something, well, British and we're never going to have to change. Rather like in party politics, when you used to knock on the doors and people say, yeah, we're always being Labour here, or people say, look, we're always Conservative here. It's changed. People's views on uh, where they stand, what they support, have changed. And I say that because Ruth is absolutely right in relation to the point about complacency. I do not believe there will be another Scottish referendum in the foreseeable future, possibly not in my lifetime. I'll tell you why not. Firstly, the public don't want it. Most of the British public, never mind the Scottish public, are heartily sick of referendums. They divide, they turn people against each other, the scars are deep, they're still there in Scotland, and people don't want to go through that again. Secondly, 
The emotion uh, of uh, what happened in 2014, it, it's still there, but the economics have got worse. Oil price is a case in point. It's interesting that nationalists now openly talk about the virtual fraudulent nature of the document they produced in 2013, which set out the economic case. None of them will stand by it now, and yet there's another one coming out on Friday. What seems to be different is we're now going to have a Scottish pound, sharing the pound is off the agenda. They've probably noticed that if you spend a lifetime abusing uh, people that you don't like and then you break away and say, now can we have a close relationship with you, it doesn't somehow work. Look, for example, at what's going on in the present time. Um, but, you know, the, the economic argument has changed. Uh, and to make the case, the economic case, I think would be very difficult. But to assume, therefore, that's it is a huge mistake, not just because, as I said, there is a core of people in Scotland who do believe that independence is, is, is the right course of action, but because if people come to believe that the union is not delivering for them uh, what is important, uh, then, uh, then the argument for breaking away uh, will gather strength. And I was interested in the arguments, because I've heard them so many times before over so many years, and heard them myself first-hand about you know, decentralisation. You know, I am very much in favour of decentralising. Incidentally, the Nationalists are probably the most centralising government there has ever been in the United Kingdom in terms of taking powers to Edinburgh away from the rest, the rest of Scotland. Uh, but I would remember in the Brexit campaign, you know, I had a walk-on part there, I was sent to Sunderland. Uh, in uh, Newcastle the week before the campaign. And, you know, when I was doing a walkabout, as you do uh, with the BBC and ITV tech cameras in full uh, tow, unfortunately, um, it, was, it wasn't a great day. And I met this young woman who came up to me and said, um, I work for Nissan. And I thought, great, I found somebody who's going to vote for it remaining. And she said, I voted for leave. And I said, why? And she said, because when we leave, there won't be duty on the cars we produce um, when we sell them to the continent. And I said, no, it's the other way around. And then she said very um, vehemently in words that the BBC happily could not broadcast, therefore this exchange was never shown, I think, live on air, uh, that I was just one of these politicians who were determined to do down the North East. And what it brought home to me was the fact that for a lot of people, the, the perception of government, whether it's in Edinburgh, if you're in Scotland, or whether it's in London, if you're in, in England and other parts of the United Kingdom as well, is important. Decentralisation on itself will not do the trick. And the essential point is this, that if you want to win any future referendum in Scotland, which I think is frankly a long way away, or if you want to ask yourself why did people vote they did in relation to Brexit, to a large extent it was the economy. It, the vo it is, there is a clear correlation in both referendums as to how people voted in relation to how well they felt they were doing or the area in which they lived, how it was doing and how they voted. London, for example, voted overwhelmingly to remain in the European Union. London is one of, if you took London out of the UK, it would still be one of the biggest economies in the world. And yet, if you go just the other side of the M25, there are towns, uh, villages, out just over the border, which voted very heavily to leave, because what they saw was things had been taken away from them. The jobs had gone, the shops had gone, things had changed. And unless we sort that economic problem out, Unless we actually, rather than just talk about decentralisation, not just of structures of decision making, but actually we make sure that the economic opportunities are available outside, particularly England's uh, big cities, then you will get more of this. I accept that we voted in the referendum of Brexit to leave. And I'm consistent in this. I said in Scotland, if you vote to leave, there's no going back, that's it. And we're in the same position now. Where we will end up, I honestly do not know. My guess is it'll be several years down the line and it may end up looking not a million miles away from where we are just now, except we don't have much say in what is going on. Maybe I'm being pessimistic. Maybe it'll be better than that. But what I do know is that if we do not fix the economic problems that have caused this rise of nationalism, this rise of the feeling that you should look in, not look out, then we will be storing up problems for ourselves in the future. It may not manifest itself in a vote in Europe, but there will be something else will come along where people will say, you're living like this because it's somebody else's fault. And here we have a solution for you, uh, which is, uh, is, going to, is going to change things. That's why I worry about not just in Scotland, 
And you know, it amazes me that so many people down here never picked up what was going on north of the border road, because the same language was used two years later in the, in the UK re referendum. But what worries, worries me is that you know, after you know, the post-war years, where people tended to be more liberal in outlook and more outward looking, we are now drawing in on ourselves. And I don't think it's a passing phase. I think it's going to go on for some time yet. But the only way, and, and the only right way, because it's, it's the right thing to do, is to make sure we fix the economics, to fix the op lack of opportunity. Yes, you can change structures. I'm all in favor of that. But unless you deliver in terms of the opportunities and people's perception that actually they are cared about, then the same problems are going to arise. And I say they will manifest themselves in different ways at different times. But that seems to me uh, something that needs to be avoided. So I think in relation to Scotland, and Ruth has put forward a compelling you know, a critique of what has happened or what could happen, uh, you know, given that Scotland has got powers to make things better. The key, though, is whether anyone, whether the politicians in London, Edinburgh, or anyone else, actually do things rather than talk about them. Because unless they start doing things, uh, then we will simply be uh, inviting people to come back another day for exactly the same uh, situation as we now have today. Thank you. Our panellists very kindly agreed to answer questions. Uh, just trying to. Gentleman in the front, uh, name and organisation. Hello, Michael Settle from The Herald. Uh, I'm going to start with you, Ruth. Um, I was just intrigued as to why you disagreed with Michael Gove, who said this morning that Brexit had actually strengthened the union. And. Um, you talk about um, the second possible Scottish independence referendum. Actually, given that the Scottish Tories support uh, increases on the back of the arguments about the union, you should be welcoming it, shouldn't you? And quickly for Lord Darling, do you think Brexit and the way it's been handled by the Conservative government is a clear and present danger to the union? Um. Let me just uh, start, if I, I may, Mike, um, by responding to Alistair's response to, to me, because um, I've watched Alistair as I've grown up and developed in, in politics in Scotland, and he speaks so much sense, and uh, I agree with so much of it. And I, I, I look to him, and I, I look to Corbyn and Macdonald, and I wonder why he's still in Labour. So. Um, <laughs> We're in but danger of starting another story. <laughs> we are in danger of starting a story. I would quit while you're ahead. <laughs> or behind. Um, in answer to the, the, the questions you asked me, Mike, I mean, I, I think, you know, one, the SNP clearly thinks that it can weaponise Brexit to, to look to another independence vote. I, I think um, what's interesting is, is as discussed, the, um, the polling and research that, that people like Sir John Curtis have carried out have shown that rather the same amount of people have moved from one camp to the other that has moved from the other camp uh, back, which is about 7% on each side. So it looks as if the numbers are static, but actually the people themselves are, are, are slightly different. Um, but I would point again to the polling that was, was put out by Policy Exchange the, this morning that, that says that while fewer people support independence, actually more are worried about Brexit being an influencer in there. So um, Brexit hasn't happened yet, and, and um, the text of my speech today was talking about let's not be complacent about that. Let's make sure that um, when things change, and we've seen a lot of change a lot of things change very quickly in politics, both in this country and in other countries, um, that we're ready. You know, I, I didn't come into politics when I started standing for the Conservative Party in 2009 to spend the rest of my life talking about the sodding constitution. Um, but you fight in the battlefield that's set in front of you. And um, I know politicians aren't held in terribly high regard, but I promise you, if it comes to a question of the country or the party, in terms of another referendum vote, then I will put the country first every day of the week and twice on a Sunday, even if that's to the detriment of the Scottish Conservative Party that I lead. Um, because I have said before, and I will say again, that the vote that took place in 2014 to me was a political campaign that is more important than any of the elections that I've ever fought as a candidate, as a leader, um, and certainly more than any I've ever voted in. And I've never missed a vote since I was 18 years old. 
Michael, I'd answer this fairly quickly. I think that the clear and present danger just at the moment is to the United Kingdom. You know, we're, in March next year, we're leaving. And we haven't started serious negotiations yet because the Conservative cabinet cannot agree what his line is on the customs union or indeed anything else. Um, and anything that weakens the United Kingdom must be bad for the United Kingdom. You know, and you know, that, that is a serious worry. Not just, you know, as I said, it, it, it's the economy that I'm most bothered about. The longer you have uncertainty, the longer you don't know where the people are going to stand, the longer this goes on, the more damage will be done to jobs. And that's why, you know, I'm so concerned that, okay, we've taken the decision, but nobody seems to have a clue where they're going. Thank you. Gentleman there. Name and organisation. Yeah. Uh, Kevin Scott from Politics Home. Uh, Ruth, just a, just a quick one. Um, you mentioned earlier that uh, Nicola Sturgeon has talked again about restarting the independent debate, even though it doesn't seem to have really stopped. <laughs> um, don't you think it's time, as far as the second referendum is concerned, for uh, Nicola Sturgeon's either put up or shut up? Well, I mean, again, as I, I sort of tried to, to lay out um, last year, I mean, we spent a lot of time prior to 2014 um, between the, the UK government and the Scottish government negotiating the, the terms of that referendum. We hadn't seen um, a position where the UK government was willing to look at, and I, I mentioned it in my speech, um, a vote to which we could dissolve the UK before, and yet amicably, um, yes, hardly negotiated, but amicably, the parameters of that was set down in what was later called the Edinburgh Agreement, and it was agreed by all sides. Um, and all sides agreed that it would be a fair, free, open and transparent referendum uh, and that the result would be respected. Um, it was fair, it was free, it was open, uh, it was transparent, it had a higher level uh, of input from the electorate at more than 84% uh, of any electoral event that we have ever seen in any part of the United Kingdom in our history uh, since Universal Franchise, and yet it has not been respected. Uh, and I think that's why the backlash that you saw immediately after Nicola Sturgeon formally requesting another referendum in March of last year to losing almost a third of our MPs in June, um, just six weeks later, I think there's a direct correlation there. There are a lot of people in Scotland who took politicians at their word that if we took part in the debate and if we did our democratic duty, which the country did, that their answer would be respected and it's not been respected and they're angry and they're tired. You know, we've had a lot of electoral events in Scotland and people are weary of this and they're weary of the cyclical and repetitive nature of it. Okay. Over there, at the back, gentlemen there. Yeah, John White of the FT. Uh, you heard this morning and um, they said that that there should be more emotion injected into uh, into the argument for union, uh, and Ruth said that it mustn't become simply a transactional arrangement of like people passing each other on the on the stairs in a flat block. Yet you, Alistair, said essentially, as I understood you, it has become a transactional uh, arrangement. There is let's dispense with all this stuff about about emotion and loyalty and so on. That's gone. What there is, is a transactional arrangement. And as long as that is okay, as long as people in Scotland feel that the, that the union benefits them financially, that's it. Is, is that a proper uh, analysis of what you were saying? Or are you saying something more? What I said is that for some people, quite a lot of people in Scotland, it has become a transactional relationship. I also said that emo the emotional arguments too are important you know, the bonds between our two countries, the bonds between families, our history, um, our influence. Uh, you know, I said those were important, but for a lot of people, you know, when, when we started the 
referendum campaign in 2012, we did a lot of research into how people felt about being Scottish and how they felt about Scotland and, and, uh, and what, it, what it was that drove them. And what was interesting was for, I don't think you'd have, I think it'd have been different if you'd done it 20 years before. Uh, for a lot of people, it has become a transactional relationship. And you have to be aware of that, which is why I said it's the economy that is really one of the big drivers. If people think they're going to be worse off, they will go one way. If they think they'll be better off, they'll go another way. Uh, but I didn't, uh, you know, and I think if, if I look at the, the Brexit campaign, uh, which I think was over heavy on the, you know, the economy and the bad things, although I, I do agree it is difficult to make an emotional case to love the EU if you are not if you're on this side of the channel, I think you can make it quite successful for obvious reasons on the other side of the channel. Uh, you know, but you know, we, we do have a lot of emotional history, but the gen you know, the people who go to vote, settle in a general election, they you know, no matter what they may say before they go to the polls, time and time again we know what drives them is what's best for me and my family. And that's transactional. Gentleman there from Batsy. Name and organiser. Colin Kidd, University of St Andrews. Uh, for, for, for those of us who voted no in, in, in both of the recent uh, re referendums, we've got rather used to be, being told that 55-45 was, oh, it was a damn close run thing, but that 52-48 was utterly decisive. Um, I'm a bit more pessimistic than Alistair about the prospects for another referendum, but if if we do have one, is it is it is it time to get the old Cunningham Amendment out of out of the closet and and think think more carefully about what a decisive result would be? In other words, to bring some sort of legitimacy threshold into the debate. Was that Colin? Was that to me or Alistair? That's to both of you. Well, my view is rather closing the stable door, isn't it? Uh, I don't think you can go back now and say, well, this time we're going to have a different set of rules. Um, the Cunningham Amendment in 1979 actually swayed quite a lot of people to vote in the opposite way that he wanted, because there's, why are you imposing this threshold which doesn't exist anywhere else? We don't have a threshold for MPs, for example. Um, so I, I don't think you can do it. I think you have to win this thing with a political argument, fair and square. Um, and, but you know, like you, if you look at the percentages here, I think you, know, you have to accept that the uh, Leave side won. Uh, but equally, one of the things you have to do in politics is recognise that when nearly half the country is on the other side, uh, that something of an accommodation sometimes doesn't go amiss. I bet you if it had gone the other way, people, if the people who leave had lost, they wouldn't be saying, oh, that's a fair cop, that's it, you won't hear from us again. I don't think so. Yeah, I mean, I have to say, um, for somebody who was involved in it, I'm amazed um, that Alistair has... Um, kept his, his grace uh, off the back of the um, referendum in 2014 when we had lots of people that were based in parts of the country that hadn't paid any attention to the Scottish uh, independence referendum at all and whose knowledge of Scotland was popping up to the Edinburgh Festival once every four years um, telling people that, oh, that was a terrible result to only take it to a living point difference, thanks very much. I mean, I, I did feel a, a bit irked by that because that was a, a very, very hard fought campaign. Um, and I think one of my great regrets in terms of the Brexit referendum campaign is that some of the lessons from Scotland weren't learned at a UK level and weren't learned by the UK government. Um, and one of the lessons that I think should have been learned is that you know you, you can't knock down an argument in six months and going for a vote on Brexit basically an up and down vote within six months of, of calling it and holding it um, after 40 years of governments of all stripes saying Europe's terrible by the way why don't we vote to stay in um, you know was, was never going to work to, to debunk some of those myths and, and one of the great tragedies that I've spoken about since and I believe that it was spoken about earlier at this conference and I'm, I'm sorry I wasn't able to attend earlier was the lack of care and the lack of attention in that six months that was paid to the Irish question and that's a sin an absolute sin um, and <coughs> I think one of the lessons that should have been learned is that it takes a minimum of 18 months to really get down to the brass tacks of, of uh, 
you know, a big constitutional question. And if we say questions are so big and they're so complicated that they cannot be decided by representatives in a representative democracy, it has to be done by direct democracy, then we have to give time for those questions to be digested and be discussed and to be, uh, you know, taken apart and, and ruminated over. So, um, you know, that, that is one of the, the, the great sadnesses, I think, of, of, of this time. And, and as I've said before, and it, it sounds from the tone of your question, um, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, that you seem slightly to be where I am, which is um, having partaken in two referenda and having won one and lost one, and which in Scottish football terms isn't a bad result. I think I'd, I'd rather, you know, remove myself from the field because I, I would happily never fight another referendum again because binary referenda put people into camps. Uh, and I don't think that's healthy for the body politic. I don't think it's healthy for the public discourse. And I see much of what we've seen post-2014 in Scotland now being writ large across the whole of the UK. And it, and it saddens me because our politics never used to be this scratchy. It never used to be this tribal. It never used to be that you would only listen to what somebody had to say about education if you'd worked out first if they were in your tribe on something else. And, and um, it's going to take us a long way to walk back from that. But we have a duty so to do if we want to be the country that we should aspire to be as one of the great nations of the world, one of the G7, one of the G20, one of you know, the UN5. You know, we, we have a responsibility to be better than we are. Um, and I, like I say, I would, I would happily never fight another referendum again. Final two questions, if you take them as a clutch. Gentleman at the back. Name and organisation. Hello, Todd Clayton, Daily Record. Uh, Aren't you wrong? The lessons of the 2014 referendum were learned. They were learned by the Leave camp and played out in 2016, where emotion triumphed over economics, as, as you saw yourself, Alistair, in the Northeast. Uh, and aren't you in danger of fighting the last war, your last campaign, when the, the next campaign against nationalism will be that, camp, that, that battle of emotions, not economics? One more question. Gentleman there in the middle. My apologies to anyone I may have disappointed. This is probably more one for Alistair. Name an, orga name an organisation. Jeff Webster, no real affiliation, but a supporter of the union. Um, given the difficulty the UK is having leaving the EU without you know, creating damage to its economy, given it's got a trade deficit with the EU, pays money into it, has a budget surplus, doesn't share the economy, could Scotland actually leave, given they receive a massive block grant, they have a big trade deficit, a trade surplus, they actually have a budget deficit, and they share a, a, a currency. Just seems to me like, you know, even just crossing any of those boundaries, the impact to the economy is so, going to be so great, they're going to you know, roll back from it and never actually be able to make that step. Well, uh, I'll answer that, but I'll also touch on Torkel's questions. Yes, the Leave campaign did observe very closely, uh, particularly how Alex Almond, if there were a set of facts that were inconvenient before his time, invented alternative facts. And they also watched that if you repeat an alternative fact often enough, uh, people say, well, yeah, we know it's not true, but he said it. And, you know, it, it, it works. Um, where I did, first time I disagree with Ruth this afternoon, 18 months uh, for a referendum is a hell of a long time, um, uh, having served two years. Um, I'll split the difference and make it 15. I mean, you've got a perfectly fair point, you need to make the argument. But what we found was the longer it went on, the deeper the gouging, the deeper the scarring and the damage that, that was done. In relation to uh, your point about um, could Scotland do it, I was always clear on the referendum, uh, because the nationalists used to say, you're saying we couldn't do it on our own. Yes, we, we could, but you'd have to take the consequences. If you look at, you should read it, the, Scot the, the white paper that was produced at public expense and prepared by civil servants in the Scotland office set out you know, an economic scenario that assumed that the oil price would remain well into $120 or so, if, if not higher. And that was built into it. Uh, and it was never comprehended, it never accepted. It could possibly go below. Anyone who said that was talking Scotland down. That's another phrase that we got in the Brexit as well. Um, but yes, we could, but there would be consequences. And you know, I'm told that Friday's document in Scotland is going to be honest. And it's going to say, you vote for this way, but there might be a few tricky years. 
And, you know, the Brexiteers might have said that, yes, we're going to leave. Of course, there's going to be a, a spot of disruption as we break off trading relations with, you know, most of the people we trade with and go and search new uh, uh, markets around the world. But that's something that they think was worth the price. Uh, unfortunately, in neither case did anyone actually say that. Uh, but in both cases, what's interesting after the event is there's no shortage of people who are now blaming other people for what happened in Scotland, just as I notice every single day now, there is someone prominent in the Leave campaign who is already laying the ground for why it wasn't their fault. In terms of answering Torkel's uh, point, I think the best campaigns are won through both emotion uh, and rationalism. Um, I think uh, in the referendum campaign, you know, I wasn't a former Chancellor of the Exchequer, so I didn't always talk about the money. Um, Alistair had that base kind of covered. Um, but in terms of, of things that I wanted to talk about, and the, you know, Alistair is absolutely right, um, and without telling any tales of, of the really comprehensive uh, polling and, and uh, focus grouping that was done during the whole course of, of the referendum campaign, um, there were different types of people that were attracted to voting. Uh, either for independence or to stay part of the United Kingdom for lots of, of different reasons. And, and Alistair is absolutely right to talk about the fiscal rationalists. Um, and I can't for the life of me remember the name of, of what type they were. But there were also people for whom they, were, they did respond to the idea of belonging to something bigger. And, and a lot of the arguments that um, I wanted to run was to talk about the idea that you know we're not that different, and, and to debunk the Scottish exceptionalism. So I personally would talk about my own story of having you know worked for the BBC, having served in the uh, Territorial Army, of having you know my sister, an NHS doctor in Newcastle, my best mate, a physio in the NHS in, in Liverpool, and me um, at that point was was representing Glasgow and, and three cities more alike you couldn't find. And why do you want to put a bloody great border down the middle of them? So um, you know we we had different roles and we had different people responding to, to different things and um, you know like I say the best campaigns are one appealing to both heart and head. Thank you. I'm sorry to bring proceedings on this panel, indeed the conference as a whole, uh, to an end. It's been uh, an outstanding uh, day. It's been outstanding that uh, for us, policy exchange should be at the heart of this uh, national discussion. Um, before asking you all to leave by the back entrance because the cameras are set up because of the great national uh, media interest uh, here on this side door. So if we can go via the back door, I just want to uh, say thank you to Alistair for responding. Thank you to Ruth. Uh, it's been a masterclass from both of you, and please join me in expressing. Appreciation to them. <laughs> All our other people.